Herzlichen Dank. So. Herzlichen Dank. So. Mit ein wenig Koffein im Blut starten wir jetzt in den nächsten Themenkomplex dieser Fachkonferenz, liebe Teilnehmende. Hier soll es jetzt um Erfahrungen aus 20 Jahren Anwendung der Washingtoner, Washingtoner Prinzipien gehen. Und wir haben schon vorhin gehört vom Prisma jenseits der Rückgabe. Da war die Rede vom Katalog der Möglichkeiten einer fairen und einer gerechten Lösung. Und genau dieses Kaleidoskop wollen wir ein wenig so. Now we want to start, and we start with our next uh, section by also looking at examples, because we're going to hear about some case studies, individual cases that give us an, an overview about the whole range of what is a fair and just solution. Love to continue. Yeah. So, and above all, we are going to talk about the uh, points of view of victims and their descendants, and in particular, the experience um, of individuals as a supplement to the experience of institutional facilities. And you will find there are some amazing stories. But before, by way of an example, we are going to share some concrete examples with you. We would like to also talk about the role of uh, other bodies. You know that the Washington Declaration was also the starting point of uh, some of these to be established. And as we've heard several times in Germany, the Limbach Commission was um, instituted after the Washington Principles were accepted. That's originally the exchange of opinion before we start with uh, individual cases. Now, let us hear from Dr. Agnes Paristeki. I'm very happy you're with us. Welcome to you and Professor Wolf Tigetov. Um, to you too, a very warm welcome. Please, both of you, uh, join me on the stage. I will tell you something, first of all, about Agnes Perestegi. For over 20 years, she's been involved in the issues of restitution. She is part of the Commission for Art Recovery, established in 1997, acts as an advisor to non-profit organizations, to survivors and their heirs. Please, Agnes, sit down. We also have with us Wolf Tigetov, member of the advisory uh, committee on the return of cultural property um, seized as a result of Nazi persecution, especially Jewish property. I'm very happy that you're standing in for um, uh, Papier, who is uh, the head of your organization. Now, before we start, let's take stock and look about why and for what purpose this advisory commission was set up, or advisory commissions in other countries. When is your activity? When do you start becoming active, Agnes? Okay, we are not yet by the dolmetschern Well, we have not yet reached the interpreters with a question, apparently. The interpreters have been saying it. Well, as you will see, we have not rehearsed this session, so... <laughs> Um, the idea behind the commissions was, in my view, the special legal situation in Europe. Because in Europe, um, statute of limitation would usually bar even state museums to the accession work and give it back to the rightful owners. But Europe has, most of the, most of the European states have a centralized uh, Ministry of Culture and uh, through the Ministry of Culture and through these commissions, uh, the European states can actually achieve restitution from the public collections because they can give, they can make the decision uh, to give back looted art. Mm. Compared to the United States where such commission would not have the same effect or uh, terms of reference. May I ask for your attention? Darf ich Sie bitten? Could you please listen and not uh, 
always leave because it makes it much more difficult to talk when you are all so noisy. Mr. Tigatov, perhaps you could answer, uh, add to that. The looted work of art ending up in a German museum or an institution in between 1933 and 1945, that is a very simple case. And we don't even need the word fair for that, just would just be enough. Unfortunately, the situation is not like that. Very few cases we had were actually looted works of art. What we deal with is uh, works of art which were forced, uh, forced sales of works of art by Jewish people who wanted to immigrate or who wanted to help family members to immigrate and uh, were thus forced to sell their possessions. And every once in a while we even have a case when people were already in a safe country, so to say, whatever what safe means in those years. Mm. And the works were outside uh, uh, of the Nazi administration. But even then, I mean, if the economic situation of the owners was such that they had to sell their paintings or whatever, this is also a case for, uh, of course, for uh, our commission. So these are the complicated cases. And in most situations, we don't have the document uh, documentation we need uh, for very good reasons, of course. These people left the country with just a suitcase and they didn't bring all their files with them, of course. So they have no documentation on their side. And actually, you can't expect them to prove uh, what happened to them and what happened to their possessions. So uh, we usually have the very difficult cases which we are confronted with in our commission. And this is a point where you can't just have a legal decision, where you have to have a moral or ethic decision, and that's where we are there for. So let us very briefly look into these complex cases and also ask your mandate. What is the mandate that these advisory commissions have? To what extent can you do things and how far can you go? Because we were installed um, by the federal government and the lender governments and the representation of the German cities, which are the major institutions which uh, uh, have museums and have museum possessions. And our mandate is that we should deal with the cases intensively, so it's usually files and files of paper we have to go through and then find a solution which we then present to the two parties and hope that it will be a solution which both sides can agree upon. Mm -hmm. Agnes, Agnes, perhaps quite apart from what we've heard already, you can give us an insight into one such complex case and I would also like to ask what exactly is the way you handle this? I mean, first of all, you need to have an awful lot of knowledge before you have some sort of idea, orientation, what would be the moral, the fair, the just solution in a given case, which is usually very complex. What exactly is the procedure you take? What steps do you take? Well, I personally never presented a particular case to the Nimba Commission. The Commission for Art Recovery is not a claimant organization or a claims organization. We usually work on policy issues. And um, uh, instead of uh, going into the details of some of the cases that uh, many of you probably read about in the press, I would turn back to the original mandate of the Commission because I think uh, we have an issue right there. Um, when these commissions were established, and at the time of the Washington Conference, Nobody thought that we would be here 20 years later. So the entire setup is something that was planned as temporary. Uh, you may remember the idea was that in 10 years we would deal with all these issues. Whoever in the audience remember those, those deadlines, that's why the UK Commission now needs to amend their existence so they don't, uh, they're not legislated out of existence uh, next year. So we, ha we had this whole 
temporary structure. And when you have a temporary structure and when you don't think about the future, you don't build the institutions, uh, you don't do the thinking, you don't do the, the work. It's really needed to have a complex system that actually works. It's not the uh, mistake of the commissions. It's, there is, you know, I, I, I'm not even sure that there is anyone particular or, or any of us to be blamed for that. This is how it was set up from the beginning. Uh, when you read the commission uh, mandate, you, although it's an advisory commission, the first sentence is always about mediation, finding an amicable solution. The claimants are not looking for an amicable solution. The claimants are looking for their artworks. So, uh, the, and I think it's very important that uh, we think about the Limbaugh Commission, something that the German system thought at the time would fit the general legal uh, landscape of Germany. You have, this is my understanding today, you have three different types of procedures in Germany. You have the court system, you have arbitration, and you have mediation. Um, therefore, I'm sure someone at one point thought that we have to name the advisory commission. We have to put the advisory commission into one of these categories. And since the first two was completely inapplicable, they put it into the mediation category. The advisory commission has not mediated a single case. The advisory commission is not a mediation commission. The advisory commission is an out of German legal structure commission, as actually the German court held. Because when there was one case challenging access to information in Germany, that case concluded that the Limburg Commission is outside of the legal framework. So why is the word mediation is an issue from the claimant standpoint? The problem was for the last 20 years or 15 years that for mediation, you need two parties. So the advisory commission worked only if there was a joint submission to the advisory commission. And this was a problem because some of the claimants had a claim and if the museum decided that they do not want to spend the energy to find a claim because obviously they disagreed with the claim in the first place. Therefore, they just did not agree to go to the Nimba Commission. Um, I was very happy to hear it today that this may change, and at least those museums that receive federal funding would be financially punished if they don't agree to come to the Nimba Commission. But I'm not sure that's really uh, the best way or the only way to deal with this issue. If we take out mediation, and we just call the advisory commission what it really is, because what do the claimants want? They want to uncover historical truth and they want historical justice to be served. And this is what an advisory commission can do. It advises. It advises about what's just. And it's not mediating. It's not taking the two sides on an equal way as unfortunately lately the Dutch commission seemed to be uh, diverging to. But it, it should really look at what happened and based on the original injustice, and not about who the claimant is today, whether a claimant is a relative, whether it's an institution. Of course, it's not the children and the grandchildren because of the Holocaust. So it's not their fault who the claimant is today. And justice is not served to them. Justice is served to the original victims. So that's the starting point. And I think if the Limba Commission would act as a true advisory commission and take their expertise and wisdom to deliver historical justice, I think the claimants will be much happier. That was a very critical point which you addressed. Now, of course, one might assume um, if people thought, ah, oh, well, in 10 years' time, this will be sorted and over and done with, and now it's 20 years after the Washington Principles, and we're still right at the beginning, or if you like, uh, we just got the tip of an iceberg. So positively, one could say that all these complex approaches to a solution which existed can serve as a role model, and maybe they facilitate the work of an advisory commission. Is that so? And we learn by every case. So we didn't have, well, we didn't have too many cases, that's for sure, but we didn't have two, two, even two cases which were in any way like each other. Every case was different. And so, of course, we, we, we developed two, hopefully. I think there is some progress in, in, in the commission. 
and there is reform. And uh, I think every institution uh, needs to be in constant reworking and constant reform if it's, it's supposed to have a future, otherwise it wouldn't have a future. And uh, I hope we will be able to deal with these even more complicated cases in the future. And it can only be on this moral level because uh, the legal basis usually is no longer there. And uh, what is decisive in the end is what is probable. What was a probable situation which led to the loss of the work of art to a pati particular person or family or whatever? Um, if I may. <laughs> hmm? I think one of the uh, very important uh, amends to the Commission uh, bylaws uh, two mm. years ago was the ability to call on outside expert advice. When the Commission was set up, when we started on the road, we thought that wisdom and, and general understanding and sensitivity mm. would be enough to deal with these cases because our field was not really developed. 20 years later, we know that provenance research and our field is light years ahead. There are very complex issues there are very specific information. There is a lot of uh, expertise out there, both art historical, historical, and legal. And it's not possible for every commission member to, to have all that expertise. So um, I think it's a very good development that the commission can call on independent experts. And I really hope that and the commission do. will use that yep. uh, uh, more in the future. Yeah. Yeah. vielleicht noch ein bisschen. Perhaps you could, um, perhaps you could also tell us how successful these, uh, this advisory commission is actually working. If success means that you do arrive at a fair and just solution, however it may be, are there cases where such a solution cannot be reached, or do you always have uh, have a successful resolution? Hopefully, I can answer that one in German, please. Uh, fair and just, or fair and equitable, for us tends to mean unequivocal. So whenever we can give an unequivocal recommendation, we will decide to do so. That means restitution, yes or no. The very few cases where we have tried to arrive at a settlement were only done so with both parties agreeing. Nobody ever forced either party to comply with a settlement solution. If that had been the case, that one party wasn't willing, we would have said, no, then we won't go for a settlement. We try to make an unequivocal decision, although there are situations where such an unequivocal decision is simply impossible. If the two parties are both agreeable to somehow go home with a solution that satisfies them, that's an option. We should not forget that there are many cases which are already decided earlier if the situation is so clear, and that's the example I, I gave you earlier, if the situation is so unequivocal, well, then nobody needs to get us involved. If the, the parties don't notice themselves that the situation is clear, then maybe we can help them to understand that. Say, look, it's pointless for you to go for a big court case. You're going to end up with egg all over your face. And as a, as a rule, if we tell them this, then they come to some solution without us. And in the majority of cases, I uh, don't want to repeat any figures of that, but mainly it's a decision worked out straight between the, the former owners, their descendants, and the uh, institutions in charge of the mu objects, uh, usually museums, uh, today. And normally, there is uh, a very loud and press uh, Hand, head, uh, headline making decision, and usually it's a quiet one. Right before we come to an end, Agnes, um, Agnes has already uh, made clear that she criticizes the very structure of this commission. Where do you see the weaknesses, Mr. Tigodov? Where would you like to get more help? I have to be extremely cautious how I put this across. I think we should, um, you know, speak bluntly, so just go ahead. I think the mandate we were given is a political one, and I cannot decide on my own mandate. What I can imagine is that 
um, maybe more support, but support will depend on the number of cases. We've only dealt with so, many, so few cases because so few applications were received. If the number of applications made to us would um, skyrocket, we would uh, say, right, uh, a commission as such is not enough. We, we need several chambers, but it doesn't look as if that's likely. As far as um, unilateral um, decisions are concerned to turn to us, I think that's a matter for lawyers to get involved in. It's not for us to decide. Uh, since we only are able to give a recommendation, um, the recommendation can never be used in law. Yeah, but uh, what what is it that you would criticize here? Just tell us what you don't like about the system. Well. Ms. Grittis has already um, said that what she's willing to do, obviously she speaks for the federal level only, the regions, the lender in Germany, the German states have not been consulted, nor have the German municipalities, so we'll have to wait and see how what she plans will really work. Obviously, well, let's put it this way. One shouldn't underestimate the importance of the moral issue here. If we, for example, recommend to return um, an art item after we have looked into this very carefully, and then there's virtually no German public institution that would object. I think, you know, that's simply a fact. And we haven't ever experienced this either. Obviously, uh, people weren't tremendously happy when we made a decision to uh, return um, an object, but nobody has um, complained afterwards and said, you could have done that differently. So, you know, our recommendations do seem to have a certain moral uh, impact, at least in Germany. I'm sorry, but I think we cannot really just speak about the Limbo Commission in a vacuum. The Limbo Commission uh, work starts when a claimant makes a claim or a claimant thinks that one of the claimant's work is in a German collection. And what happens after? How are the claims getting prepared before it reaches the Limbo Commission? Today, if a museum gets a claim, the museum may apply to the Lost Art Foundation for funding, and then they will do their official report. That report would be, again, I need to emphasize the official report, which would be published. The claimant comes, and the claimant's only choice at that moment is to dispute that report. My suggestion would be, if that's a possibility, that by reforming the contact point for the claimants, this initial research would be done jointly with the claimants. Why can the claimants and the museum agree on the researcher? You have about 260,000, sorry, 260 <laughs> uh, provenance researchers in der Germany. Many of them have no uh, permanent positions. Many of them go for one month here, two months there. I think you have the expertise here and you have the pool. So why can't they just agree who's doing the research? Why don't you do the research openly? The claimants can see uh, where the researcher is going. The researchers can ask the claimants. Of course, it goes both ways. Can ask the claimants to give some information. Uh, I think doing the process together would restore the faith of the claimants in the process because the process may not be inherently wrong. It just looks one-sided. And once it looks one-sided, it creates an impression. What the claimants want today is to have a day, maybe not in a court, but in a forum. They want to be able to tell their story. They want to feel that they were taken seriously, that what they wanted to say was listened to, that they got access all the information when they wanted to. And that's not a legal work. You need to be sensitive while doing this work so people feel that the process was right. If people feel that the process is right, even if they won't get back the art, they would feel that they receive justice mm -hmm. because they understand it. And many of the cases, I think you can reach that understanding if you involve the claimants in the process from the beginning. Herzlichen Dank. Many thanks. Thank you also for the uh, suggestion of having greater transparency and also this networking which uh, you've addressed. Agnes uh, Perestegi and Wolf Tegedov, thank you very much for this exchange of views. And we would now like to um, 
go through some of these very individual fair and just solutions, which we would like to do by way of short presentations, and I'm very happy that we are able to welcome many guests to do this today. As first, I would like to ask Becky Con Vargas from California to uh, join me here. She has been very involved in inclusive schooling in the United States, but today she is here as a representative of the Heinemann family. I'd also like to um, be joined by Anneke de Ruda, a provenance researcher since 2014, working at the DZK funded project at the Lüneburg Museum. So welcome to you both, and these uh, two will tell you about the story of the Heinemann family. Good afternoon. As a child, I was born in the shadow of the Holocaust, only seven short years after the end of World War II. And our family was very, very small, but I grew up hearing stories of a much larger family. And actually, just like the Israeli ambassador spoke this morning, I heard about this town of Lüneburg and how beautiful it was. That was where my grandmother grew up. But many of the stories were terribly sad and very upsetting because both my parents had to flee and many of the family members were murdered by the Nazis. But not all the stories were sad. I especially was intrigued about hearing about my great-grandfather, whose name was Marcus Heinemann. Marcus had 17 children. <laughs> there he is with his children. And this is actually a sad photo, too, because the youngest child was born, and the mother got an infection, Henrietta. Um, and she died shortly after. So this picture is the father with the 17 children, the baby, and a picture of his wife. He was terribly sad about that. And so when I was in my 20s and I liked to travel, my grandmother would always say, we have a relative there. And I'd meet these different people. I, I went to Guatemala and I met family members in Guatemala. I went to Paris and met family members in Paris. And I always heard about a family member in South Africa who had a horse farm, but I never got to meet her. But everything changed when I got an email from Anneke. Anneke de Ruda, she was a historian working at the Museum Lüneburg. And they were looking for members of our family because they had items from our family from the estate of Marcus Heinemann. So this is a little bit of a different story than a claimant coming to complain we were reached out to by the museum. So I was thrilled when I finally got to meet her via email. There were actually Heinemann descendants out there. After hitting some dead ends first to Becky's cousin, for instance, my email sounded so suspicious, she just threw it away. And I also got an angry call from a man who thought I wanted to play tricks on his old mother. So after these first setbacks, it was a great relief to get in touch with somebody from the other side, from the Heinemann family. Oh no, sorry. <laughs> Provenance research at the Museum Lüneburg had started only two months earlier. The museum is a small museum in a small town uh, in northern Germany. It's a museum of cultural and natural history. It's a local museum. Um, it's probably one of the first small local museums to do this kind of provenance research. There was some public pressure. Uh, already in 2012, a Lüneburg local historian had accused the museum of harboring Nazi looted art, items bought in 1940 from the estate of Jewish banker Marcus Heinemann, who had died in 1908, and who had been one of the major friends and sponsors of the old museum, which was founded in 1896. Funded by the Provenance Research Commission, I had started to research the case. It soon turned out that this was Nazi looted art indeed. The items had been bought unlawfully and below value as part of the forced so-called Aryanization of the Heinemann estate in 1940. 
the family Bible, which you see, um, was, wasn't part of the museum's collection. That's another interesting story. It was a private item given to the museum by a family who lived in the Heinemann house in the 1950s. They had heard of this, um, of this yeah, research process and they uh, reached out to the museum and so they said, uh, we would like uh, to give this Bible to you to also return it to the rightful owners together with uh, the, the items you've got in your collection. The Bible was really the most sentimental item of all the things we gave back. It held part of an embroidered handkerchief owned by Henrietta Heinemann, the mother of the 17 children, Marcus's wife. And it was also a very powerful research tool since its first pages contained a handwritten Heinemann family tree, which was, uh, of course, immensely helpful with a family of 17 children, you can imagine. Um, Fortunately, the family had left many traces in the town's history and many researchers before me had already worked on their history. However, there were no current names and no current addresses. So I did a lot of asking around and Googling and in the end, I not only found Becky, but, but I found many other members of the family all over the globe. During the next months, we shared. We shared photographs, as you see here, we shared stories, dates, memories, and above all, together, we reached an understanding about a just and fair solutions, solution, and actually without any lawyers. <laughs> Sorry for the lawyers in the audience. Yeah. <laughs> no job for you there. <laughs> So when the new Lüneburg Museum opened in March 2015, it included some Heinemann items based on the first findings of the Provenance Research Project. By that time, we were actually already planning a restitution and Heinemann reunion in the summer, although we hadn't yet found descendants of all branches of the family. At the same time, after some discussion, I have to admit, the Lüneburg Museum Association, who was still the official owner of the items, officially agreed to restitute them. Luckily, times had changed since the 1940s. The association now lived up to its responsibility and decided to reach out to the Heinemann heirs, taking up a tradition that had been destroyed by their predecessors in the Third Reich. Marcus Heinemann, his two brothers, and several other Jewish citizens had been co-founders of the Museum Association in 1878 and had always supported the museum generously. You can see their signatures under the founding document of the Museum Association. Association. Many Heinemann items had been destroyed by bombs or fires over the years or had simply been lost. Still, we managed to restitute some objects from the 1600s to the 1800s that all showed Marcus Heinemann's strong attachment to Lüneburg's history. Coins, medals, stained glass windows, Renaissance and Baroque furniture, historic documents and books, and a picturesque drawing of the old town. As was said today, a reminder of a vanished world. However, the restitution and the reunion, I would say, and I think you probably agree, they weren't so much about the objects themselves. But without the objects, none of this would ever have happened. This reconnection, as Stuart Eisenstadt said today. This, the citizens of this little town in North Germany, they wouldn't have opened their homes and their hearts to the descendants of those men and women who had been robbed, persecuted, driven out of Germany, and to their death by previous generations of Lüneburgers. And Heinemanns from all over the world wouldn't have traveled to this little town in North Germany and discovered their roots and, of course, each other's stories. So you can imagine, when I received the email from the museum, I was, on one hand, I wasn't surprised, but yet I couldn't believe there were family members all over the world that descended from these 17 on my mother's side. And you can see here all the different countries where they ended up and where they moved to. 
So I started working with Anaki to look for the family members. And I wrote an email to the heirs, and I uh, told them about the museum's desire to return items to us. And actually, just the other day, I found out from one of my British relatives that she was actually quite suspicious, even getting the email from me. She said, what is this? Is this a scam? Is somebody trying to take money? And so they had to investigate on their own. It was strange, this person from the United States and uh, someone from Germany writing to people who we didn't know from all these different backgrounds. And one of the people we found was Helga, who's, when I wrote, she was 96 when I created this PowerPoint, but she actually turned 97. And she, she and I spoke on the phone the other day, and she is in Florida. She had lived for 30 years in Venezuela, and um, that was where she went after she escaped camps in Germany, several camps. And actually, she said, I wish I could go to Germany. I don't think I'm quite up to it. But I still drive around town here, and I go to Costco, and I go to Walmart. So <laughs> she's definitely, and she can hear and speak so clearly. It's been wonderful getting to, to know her. So we started sharing stories through these emails. We did some Skyping, and we gathered together the photos, as Annika said. And I. Um, particularly like this photo at the top, Marcus's youngest son, the one that was the baby in the picture. He became a doctor and he went to Sumatra. In addition to taking care of people, he rescued these little tigers. And um, his family ended up in Holland. So um, the emails went back and forth. Now it was time to figure out what to do. And I, I proposed actually giving the items to the museum. But some of the relatives in Israel said maybe it would be better to make it a loan and loan for 10 years. And the reasoning we had, the reason we didn't pick a Jewish museum to give it to was the idea of staying connected to Lüneburg. And both the fact that there were so many descendants that it wouldn't make sense for any one of us to have. Of course, the family Bible was the one we maybe all would have wanted. But it would be better to give the items to the museum to, or loan them as we ended up doing, and that way we could, could go there and we could stay connected because, as Annika said, the Heinemann family was very prominent in Lüneburg at a certain point before the Nazis came to town. So then we decided to meet in Lüneburg and present the loan and have a reunion and meet each other. And so this is um, a picture we were all posted in the museum. And actually, Anna came at her house, greeted us with these wonderful flags from all the countries that we came from, including Nicaragua, which my husband is from, and surprised him that she had one of his flags there. So we began <laughs> to meet each other and get to know each other. And also, Marcus Heinemann had brothers. And his brother, Solomon, um, is the one that had descendants that went to Guatemala. And actually, the family photo, it's later, um, there are 100 people in Guatemala who descended from Solomon Heinemann. So our reunion began at the museum. And Anaki made this wonderful family tree that had six generations. And we all could find ourselves on the, on the um, family tree that was posted, as you could see, for ever, everyone to see in the front of the museum. And another interesting thing is that not all the family members are Jewish, but Marcus Heinemann was very religious and Jewish, but over time, some of the family members and the subsequent generations, we actually represented Jewish and Christian families, and we have people of different racial backgrounds as our family grew and diversified. So Aniki took us on a tour, and we got to l meet people and go to the homes where our family members had lived. And there's even a street named after Marcus Heinemann that um, during the Nazi era, they removed the sign, and they took this, um, you know, they changed the name of the street. And then after the Nazis were gone, they put the sign up. And there's a story that it's the exact same sign that someone had hidden it. We don't know if it's true. But um, it's a great story. And that's one of the problems in all this history is there's so many stories trying to make sense of them all. 
We also went to a school where all Marcus's and Henrietta's children went. And they have, we made a presentation, I'm up there at the top, making a presentation, and at the bottom there's a, actually a, they honor some members of our family who became quite famous, including my grandmother's brother, Fritz Heinemann, who was a famous philosopher. And there on the bottom, on the right there, the, um, they were showing us their report cards. They still had report cards going all the way back to um, the 1800s and the beginning of the 1900s. We also got to see the relationship between Christians and Jews that existed during the time that Marcus and his family were um, working as bankers. And they actually, the family gave a church a beautiful um, stained glass window, and you can see the Heinemann name there. And there was a lot of interchange. It didn't mean that it had always been good. The Jewish cemetery had been desecrated at one point, and when Marcus Heinemann was growing up, they were trying to get permission to have a textile um, business, and it was rejected several different times. But eventually, Marcus and his family, um, before the Nazis came, re achieved great prominence as part of the museum and as part of the town. We also visited um, a small room that had served as a synagogue in Lüneburg. But then Marcus and the family donated the money to make this beautiful, very magnificent, magnificent synagogue. And you can see the outside and the inside. When the Nazis came, the synagogue was destroyed. Here you can see them posing as they're destroying the inside of the synagogue that you saw. leaving an empty space where the synagogue had been. And so we went to the site of the synagogue and with a rabbi who came from another town because there are no Jews in Lüneburg right now or to my knowledge, they, we had a, a ceremony remembering the family members and the other Jews in Lüneburg who had been killed. And actually just this month they made a much nicer um, memorial, and they, they opened it this month on the 9th of November. We were also hosted by the mayor of the city, and they have a, in their Rathaus, and we took, up top is the picture of all of us there with the mayor. But the highlight of our trip was the restitution ceremony. And we had put together a statement that we had the youngest heirs read at the ceremony. And there you can see them up in the middle on the top. And I'm just gonna read a little tiny bit from what the statement said. It said, we recognize that this is a symbolic gesture made by the heirs in the hopes of supporting a future that seeks peace, safety, and acceptance for people of all backgrounds where all forms of bigotry and hate are not allowed to flourish anywhere in the world. And as we know, we just had the synagogue attacked in the United States just a few weeks ago. The work needs to continue. Ruth March is a British woman whose mother was saved by the kinder transport. And she summed it up saying the feelings that we all had, she said, all my life, I've grown up with knowing that my mother's direct family was murdered and that we had only a few relatives. And then suddenly we come here and we have 40 brand new relatives from all over the world and they are such brilliant people. I personally feel a deep sense of gratitude for this whole process and what it meant for me in my life and for our family. And I recall a traditional Passover song, Dayenu, and Dayenu means that would have been enough. And that gratitude is expressed. First, the Lüneburg Museum reached out to our family with stolen items that they wanted to return to us. Dayenu, that would have been enough. They also taught us our history, and thanks to Anaki and 
I appreciated the comment about getting to pick researchers. We didn't get to pick, but we were lucky. <laughs> um, so we learned so much of the history, because Annika at this point knows almost more than any of us. And we decided to loan the items back to the museum. Diane knew that would have been enough. But another really important thing that happened was a German parliament member, the mayor, and many of the people of the town to Lüneburg, of Lüneburg actually apologized to our family and received us so warmly. So we really reconnected not only with um, each other, but also with the museum. And we made lifelong friends. And this is the Heinemann family then and now. And we've been visiting each other in different countries. So here's Anaki visiting us, California in the Redwoods with her family, Dayenu. What happened was far greater than the value of the objects. Our amazing family, once diminished, once scattered and spread around the world, has grown and managed to thrive and managed to contribute in so many ways. And we came together with our former neighbors. That is the power of provenance. Thank you. Vielen Dank. Thank you so much. Just wanted to mention Becky Kuhn Vargas. One more thing. Yeah. We made a film about our experience, and it's on YouTube. You can look it up. It's called Almost Lost, uh, the Heinemann family legacy, and you can find it. And it's also, I think, on the museum website and possibly on the, his, um, the culture website as well. Lost Art Foundation. Thanks for the hint. Annika de Rudder, Becky Kuhn Vargas. Annika de Rudder and Becky Kuhn Vargas. One of just many examples, we come now to the next. Please welcome with me Roger Strauch. He is the president of the Mosse Foundation and he heads the Mosse Art Restitution Project. A warm welcome to you. Do you need this? Thank you. Good afternoon. Thank you. Well, I'm pleased to share with you today an update on our restitution project. The Massa Art Restitution Project includes over 1,200 identified artifacts on lostart.de, the database operated by our host, the German Lost Art Foundation. There are also thousands of other art, antiquity, and antique objects yet to be identified and located from the Massa collection. I believe our project might be one of the most ambitious private, public, collaborative restitution efforts in the world. MARP, Massa Art Restitution Project's mission is to reconcile, revive, and restore the legacy of a prominent, patriotic, and progressive German, Jewish, publishing, and advertising family dedicated to philanthropy within the German state. I am the step-great-grandson of Rudolf Massa, the family patriarch. Uh, a little bit about me. Um, I am firstborn American. My mom was forced to leave Hamburg in the 30s, and my dad forced to leave Berlin in the 30s. I, um, I'm a, one of these California high-tech entrepreneurs and venture capitalists. So I have no idea what I'm doing amongst all of you right now, but I um, consider it an honor to be here and a pleasure. I represent three heirs, a private individual, the, the University of Wisconsin, and the Massa Foundation, which primarily supports prog progressive educational, artistic, and economic development projects for economically disadvantaged people. Now I'd like to review the guiding principles of our project. We are tenaciously and diligently identifying and verifying Massa family ownership of our claimed objects. We represent the memory of our family as a proud, successful, and impactful German family a century ago 
leaders in Berlin's reformed Jewish community who were wrong during the Third Reich and are deserving of asset restitution according to the Washington principles. The Massa family deserves recognition for contributions to German society and culture, especially here in Berlin where their legacy still enriches this amazing, vibrant city. We are committed to returning property to the rightful heirs as well as being sensitive to the inevitable awkwardness inherent in the process in which objects have changed hands often many times since the original expropriation. We endeavor to be collaborative and flexible in each restitution. We do not seek to cast blame. Over the last five years, we have developed strong relationships and cooperated with German provenance researchers, museums, institutional and government officials, international auction houses and private collectors to restitute 20 artifacts worth millions of dollars. We have eight more pieces in process and many other specific objects under investigation in multiple countries. We are one of the few family projects to partner with German public institutions to search for, identify, and authenticate looted art during the Third Reich. We have employed experienced, talented, and highly reputable investigators, lawyers, and researchers to support our initiative. I'm especially grateful to Eric Bartko, who is here with us today. He's our principal investigator and project leader, and Jan Hegeman from the Rao Law Firm. Yes, I actually like lawyers once in a while. Um, and um, there's one lawyer here. Um, <laughs> and we're also particularly proud and committed to our partnership with the, to, with the Masa Art Research Initiative, MARI, which was referred to earlier, at Frey University, led by Dr. Mikey Hoffman and enabled by Dr. Herman Partzinger of the SPK. MARI is focused on research only, but of course, that facilitates MARP's, Mass Art Restitution Project's restitution efforts. Since the beginning of our cooperation in spring of last year, many additional works of the Massa collection have been found thanks to their efforts. In addition to numerous provenance research experts of German museums, the students of Frey University in Berlin are also involved in this research. And a real shout out to you students out there for your contribution to this and for Dr. Hoffman's confidence in you that you can make the difference that I know you're making. In this way, the next generation of experts will become familiar with the stories <coughs> of victims of Nazi persecution, art looting, and related important subjects. My step family during the late Wilhelmian period and Weimar Republic was one of the wealthiest and most powerful families in Berlin. Rudolf Massa supported educational institutions, the German museum system, many artists of his time, and accessible healthcare services. Massa owned the Berliner Tagblatt, the New York Times of Germany, the country's leading progressive voice. The paper was against the rise of German militarism, against German entry into World War I, and attempted to counter the rise of the Nazis through editorials and satires. It is my understanding that Hitler, along with Goebbels, mentioned the Massa family name more than 20 times in public speeches to demean and vilify Jewish business people and <coughs> politically progressive points of view. In 1933, following Hitler's rise to power, the Massa family lost control of their business and personal assets and were forced to leave the country. Goebbels, who by the way only years earlier had applied for and was declined a job at the newspaper by my step-grandfather, as well as Goering, were instrumental in orchestrating the looting and monetizing of the family assets. The confisc confiscation process was well documented and involved Nazi art looting collaborators like Karl Haverstock, Hans Karl Kruger, and the Lefke and Union auction houses, which facilitated the sales for the, <clears throat> for the benefit of the Third Reich. The expropriation of the Massa family assets, as well as those of the Wertheim family, were the first large expropriations undertaken by the Nazis, a template for a looting process that became a well-oiled machine. 
To our knowledge, the objects listed on lostart.de have been rendered unmarketable on legitimate world markets. We have located and restituted, in accordance with the Washington principles, mostly paintings and sculptures from primarily, but not exclusively, public institutions in Germany. Other objects have been located and identified in Poland, Israel, Switzerland, Austria, and the United States. Many of these objects have been sold back to the current custodians or sold at auction, raising sufficient capital to pay our considerable expenses and to make distributions of financial recompense to the three heirs I represent. In 2012, when I commenced this project, we engaged an international investigation agency. Their research identified many potential Massa artifacts in Germany and Switzerland, including a painting by Karl Blecken in Staatlich Kunsthal Karlsruhe. Scholastica. Our project manager contacted the museum and identified the black and shown above as expropriated Massa art and it represented us as the legitimate heirs of the Massa estate. The museum responded by acknowledging possession of the work and undertook their own research efforts to investigate the painting's provenance. This effort took about a year and was led by an exceptionally talented, thorough, and brave provenance researcher, Dr. Tessa Rosbrock, who joins us today. Her research was probably the first extensive investigation of our claims to Massa looted artifacts and our legitimacy as claimants, other than our own. Dr. Rosbrock's report generally supported our claims and furthermore led to the identification of additional Massa artifacts, the whereabouts we had not yet, with which we had not yet become familiar. The Kunstall Karlsruhe acknowledged the restitution was in order. They also made it clear that the Blecken was fundamental to their collection and they wanted to keep it. Furthermore, they wanted our restitution process to set an excellent example to others and to set a new high standard of looted art provenance research in general and for the Massa art collection specifically. What began, frankly, as an uncomfortable restitution process, especially for me, result, because I was getting used to how to go about doing this kind of thing, resulted in a mutually acceptable private sale. Dr. Pia Muller-Tom, also joining us today, the director of the museum, and I work patiently to do what has been referred to in this conference as the right thing, or the just and fair thing. The Kunsthalle Karlsruhe asked for time to raise money to buy the Blecken, and we agreed to a reasonable price at the low end of market value. A public ceremony was held to celebrate the goodwill of the many parties involved in the restitution and transaction. According to the SPK, my step-great-grandfather was one of the largest benefactors of the Berlin Museum system a century ago. There are many objects in the museum that he simply donated. Others were later incorporated from the Nazi expropriated private Massa collection. And in 2014, in May, my chief investigator, Eric Bartko, wrote to the Ch Egyptian Museum of the SPK, identifying two antiquities, an urn and a sacrificial basin, that we believed were looted from the Massa collection and to be in the possession of the museum. To the SPK's great credit, the following happened. Our request for restitution was immediately escalated to the leadership and Providence research team of the SPK. The response to our inquiry essentially agreed the Egyptian Museum were custodians of these objects, that indeed they were probably rightfully ours, assuming we could properly document our prior ownership and the illegal expropriation of the artifacts. Moreover, their response identified eight other valuable objects within the SPK collections that the museum believed were loose Massa looted art. The SPK worked with our Berlin attorneys to identify the documentation that would support our claims as Massa heirs. I then worked closely with Dr. Herman Partzinger and his staff to identify the objects that SPK would strongly prefer to keep in their collection and others that would be restituted and ultimately sold at auction here in Berlin. Dr. Partzinger and I did not have an easy start. 
we were once trying to be honorable and just based on our respective personalities and responsibilities. We, MARP, needed financial liquidity for restituted objects. SPK wanted options to retain some of the objects in their collection. Compensation for restoration expenses, a reasonable market valuation, and time to raise money to support a transaction. Together, along with our representatives, we were able on multiple occasions to come to a mutual agreement within a reasonable period of time. And now let me show you some of those objects. This, uh, you could see the dogs in the background, greyhounds, which might possibly be from China, we're not sure, but in the front, uh, the young man is my Uncle George, um, and that is one of their castles. Um, he passed away, unfortunately, Uncle George. George Massa was a professor, distinguished professor at University of Wisconsin, history professor, and also at Hebrew University in Jerusalem. His whole life, all the Massa heirs lived very modestly um, their whole lives. Um, and, uh, but in those days, he had his own car and his own chauffeur um, and lived in one of many castles. Uh, he is the reason that I have undergone this project in his memory. Um, there is the Gaul Lion, I guess about 100 years, or a little over 100 years old. A child sarcophagus, a Roman child sarcophagus from 200 AD. And my favorite, the Damen Rota Blus by Ald Adolf von Menzel a stunning piece, it's actually of his sister, it's pastel. And this is Susanna, Susanna of biblical fame. And that last piece by sculptor Reinhold Bega shows, was identified based on our own research and the SPK leadership understandably challenged our claim we eventually satisfied the SPK that indeed Susanna was looted Masa art and we agreed upon a fair market price to keep the elegant and striking statue within the SPK system. The Masa art restitution project appreciates the guidance and support provided by national institutional leaders including Dr. Partzinger and his staff, Dr. Isabel Pfeiffer Ponskin and her colleagues, Dr. Mikey Hoffman and Dr. Klaus Kruger and their colleagues and staff and students. We have benefited from the support of Minister of Culture Monica Gruter, who just guided the decision of the German Lost Art Foundation to financially support the Mari project. And a special warm thanks, not only to Tessa, but to all her Providence Research community members in Germany. You're incredibly talented and dedicated, and the former speakers who wanted more support for you are absolutely right. Of course, there are ongoing difficulties associated with our restitution efforts. Individuals, communities, municipalities, and even states can take an inappropriate amount of time to respond to our inquiries. Even after acknowledgement of our rightful ownership, the restitution project process can take unnecessarily long. We also believe that international auction houses could improve your efforts to promote the restitution of stolen art that has passed through your commercial channels over the last 75 plus years. We would appreciate if you would confidentially contact your clients who are custodians of listed looted art to encourage them to connect with claimants, not give up their confidentiality, and constructively negotiate ownership with legitimate artifacts owners. The issue of Nazi looted art restitution is likely to be a multi-generational effort. I'm the second generation on this project. Unless, of course, all parties accelerate our collaborative work to seek reconciliation, justice, and recognition. I want to thank all of you for your attention and for your support and for your friendship. Thank you. Thank you so much, Roger Straub. Kommen zum nächsten Beispiel, zur nächsten Geschichte. This comes to the next example. Annette Gerlach is going to speak to us now. She is the head of the Rheinland-Pfalz State 
Library, and she has been working since 2002 in researching Nazi confiscated art in the Central uh, Library in Berlin. And she's going to present to us now just a children's book, Walter Lachmann and the Restitution of a Children's Book to a Holocaust Survivor. Walter Lachmann is over 19, was unable to be here out of health reasons today. He had hoped to come. A very warm welcome to Annette Gerlach. Ladies and gentlemen, first of all, let me just make two statements about myself. I have already heard that, and it's true, I was in Berlin in the Central Library where I was the head of the Nazi Confiscated Art Project, and since the end of 2012, I have indeed been the head of the library in Rheinland-Pfalz. So just to tell you a bit about the Central Library in Berlin, there's one thing you need to know to understand it better. In 1995, it was founded as a foundation, and it was the merging of the American Memorial Library, America Gedenkbibliothek, and the other main library in Berlin. Now, you will know that research on Nazi confiscated art started late in libraries. It was the end of the 90s in Bremen and in other parts of Germany, 2002. There was the first symposium in Hanover, launched by politicians there, based on the state assembly there. And the same year, at the Central Library in Berlin, initial activities began. And all of this started with uh, something we found by chance. A curious worker of ours discovered three books that had a very unusual seal. It said, The Trier Karl Marx House. And this worker was able to research this history, and it was clear that this book was confiscated by the Nazis, and these books were returned to their rightful owners or their heirs. That's not what we're talking about now, though. This was just the beginning for us looking in our central library for works that had been confiscated by the Nazis. Now, in a project that was funded here, we were looking for a method to systematically and efficiently use random searches to look through our whole collection. We were never able to actually do this. You cannot carry out this research efficiently in the sense of we'll just do a little bit, just look through some of our works. That's just not possible. And then by chance, in an archive that hadn't been looked at particularly before then, we saw correspondence which showed that the Berlin State Library in 1943 had at least 40,000, but possibly even 90,000 books of Berlin Jews, and that the library had received these. They paid per book 50 pfennigs and were given this money as a special fund on top of their usual funding. And that was 45,000 rice marks. So this correspondence showed just how great the awareness of injustice was then. There was no way of reading this one way or another. It was very clear. It was absolutely clear how you could deal with the Berlin Jews. Jewish possessions were state possessions, and therefore they had to pay for them. It was clear to us then that sifting through all of this and looking at it systematically would mean that we would have to look at all books before that we received before 1945, that every single book that we had before 1954, 45 rather, would have to be assumed as suspicious as having been stolen. We haven't concluded this project yet for a number of years now. We have got permanent positions for this research and have set up these permanent positions. Now, after the initial books of the Berlin Jews emerged from 2008, and we could prove without any shadow of a doubt where they were from, we set up a database. And this project was done in recent years. It became larger because we started working with the central 
the Central Li Library in Berlin started working with other libraries. This would be an interesting talk in itself because I think it might be exemplary of this kind of cooperation. But for time reasons, I'm not going to go into detail here. But one thing that was something that we took as an absolute given, namely the aim of all of our projects and all of our efforts, and I'm saying projects in quotes, <laughs> if you see what I mean, it was never to sort of find out more, to carry out research. It wasn't a means in its own. All of it was just about finding the descendants, finding the owners or their heirs, and giving back the books searching for the descendants, for the owners or their heirs is very hard work, and all of the experts in this room will be well aware of that, but you cannot do without it. But now let's talk to you about our children's book. This children's book belonged to a man who is now 90, and he lives in the United States. Wolfgang Lachmann is his name. He was born in 1929, 28, sorry and he lost his parents when he was just 10 years old. As he wrote to me, though this had nothing to do with the Nazis, he was an only child, and his only relation at that time was his grandmother. In 1942, he was sent to a concentration camp in Riga with his grandmother. His grandmother was murdered very quickly, and he, as a young man, was forced to carry out terrible forced labor. Losing his grandmother would have been incredibly hard for this young man. Now he was truly alone in all the world. And it, it wasn't just Riga. He was forced into other concentration camps as when, And in 1945, he was liberated in Bergen-Belsen. One year after liberation, he immigrated to the United States and changed his name to Walter Lachmann. He said that was just easier to pronounce in English. Then he had a typical American career, if you like. He carried out vocational training. He, At the same time, he finished his high school. He got married, had two daughters. He described to me how when he was up to his 50s, he never looked back at the suffering he'd experienced in the Second World War. And then in the 90s, he traveled with one of his daughters as part of an official visiting program. He visited Berlin. The aim was for her, for him to show her where the gravestone of her, his, his grandparents were in the Weissenhof Cemetery. Now, this is a book for Israelite boys and girls. That was the title of a book which we found in clearly a book that had been confiscated by the Nazis in our library. 1943, together with all the other books of the Berlin Jews, it had landed in the Berlin State Library. The question of ownership could be clarified very easily because there was the dedication to Wolfgang Lachmann, it said in the inside cover. And so very quickly we understood what it was. But of course, we had no idea how to find the owner or his heir or heirs. So to begin with, we had our result, but we didn't know what else to do next. And we documented how far we'd got. Then 2008, 10 years after the Washington Declaration, the German news magazine Spiegel wanted to report on books confiscated by the Nazis from Jews in libraries and wanted to carry out the research in our library. The peg for this was supposed to be a good example. My employee or colleague basically just pulled out a book from the library, took this children's book out, and this dedication was something that the Spiegel reporter, Michael Sontag, really liked, and so he quoted the dedication directly. Walter Lachmann one day got a call from a rabbi in his village, or in his city, rather. This rabbi regularly read 
Spiegel magazine and asked Walter Lachmann if he'd ever heard of a Wolfgang Lachmann. And he read the dedication to Walter Lachmann, and while he was reading it out, Walter suddenly remembered his book. The very same day, he wrote an email to Spiegel magazine, and Michelle Sontheimer, the very same day, passed this email on to me. He forwarded it to me. I answered it the same day back to Walter Lachmann and offered to give him his book back. Since then, we have been in regular email contact. It took a year for us to give him the book back. That was in the framework of an exhibition that we held on books confiscated by the Nazis in our library. In 2009, we weren't able to give him the book personally because his wife was sick and he wasn't able to travel for that reason. But we gave it to his daughter. This is the book. And you can see on the left-hand side the dedication. And there's a photograph as the book is returned to his daughter. And then the daughter gave him the book back when she got back to the United States. Directly after this, he wrote back to me. Once he had this book in his own hands, he said that it was clear to him that this was a miracle. He couldn't imagine that this could happen another time. And while he was flipping through the pages of his book, he remembered that this was actually never one of his favorite books. It had been a present that his teacher had given him for Hanukkah in 1937. He had been a good student in school. However, it became an important witness of his past. In 1946, when he emigrated to the United States, he had only had one photograph from his family and the concentration camp clothes on his back. That's all he had. And now he had this book as well. And for him, as an old man, this was the beginning of a process of engaging intensely, not just with the book, but primarily with his own history. He was curious and wanted to meet the people who had given him this book back. He thought the whole thing was a bit incredible that we would bother with such a simple children's book. And there was another thing. Since he had the book back, he became a witness to the events that he'd experienced and decided to go and speak about what he had experienced under the Nazi regime to school classes and told them the history of his books. There were two classes here. The John F. Kennedy High School here had a chance to hear his story and talk to him. The children were able to ask him all of their questions, and he answered every single question calmly and patiently and responded to every child, not reproaching, but clearly he told his story and everything he experienced in the concentration camps. What stayed with him, first and foremost, was the incredible hard work at, of forced labor and how hungry he always was. Warning against a repetition of this terrible past was an important message to the children and to us. And today, more than ever before, we need to be aware of the fact that we must never, ever again have this happen. That is more important than ever before. Later, his daughter told us how important it was for his father and for the whole family that this book was returned to him so that he could find inner peace with his life, even as a very old man. She encouraged him to write down his history, write down his memoirs. And for us here in Berlin, and I think I can speak for everyone who works in this project in the library today, my colleagues and former colleagues, for us here in Berlin, giving this book back was the most impressive thing we had ever experienced. We will never forget it. It remains the most unforgettable event ever because this story really galvanized us into action to do this more. The material value of its book was something we checked in the antique market. 
It could have been bought for 10 or 15 euros, but that's not the value of this book. Its value is priceless as a source of memory for Walter Lachmann, as a source of memory for his family, and a warning to all of us never to allow this to happen again. And this history shows more clearly than any publication and any conference of just how important it is to research artworks and artifacts stolen by the Nazis. It's such a complex issue that it will have to become a permanent fixture in all of the cultural institutions. And the fact that there are so many here in this room that have a green button, do look around. It says here, fixed term contract. That shows you where the problem is. We underestimated this right from the start. This is a permanent mandate of all cultural institutions. It cannot continue if it's just a project with fixed term contracts for those who work in it. And this is something that we have to understand, the funding organizations, politicians, and our institutions. We must all understand this because we need to have decent funding to be able to do this. Much has happened in these 20 years in the research of Nazi confiscated artworks. Many positive things, too, because every time one of these objects that was stolen is given back to its rightful owners, there's something valuable. We can never make things good again. The German word Wiedergutmachung, making things good again, that's impossible. We should get rid of the word, but we do have to continue in aiming for restitution. It's so complicated in today's world to even track down the owners or their heirs, but we must try to do it. I fear that when we celebrate 50 years of the Washington Principles, I think we'll still have to say there's so much work still ahead of us, but I do hope that in the next decades, when it comes to researching Nazi confiscated artworks, we make some progress at least. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Annette Gerlach. We will now stay in the halls of a library. I would like to welcome the Vice President of the Weimar Classics Foundation, Dr. Lesman, who is going to tell us about a case in the Duchess Anna Amalia Library in Weimar. Mr. Lesman, a warm welcome to you. I would like to thank the organizers for inviting me. First of all, I'd also like to thank the descendants of Arthur Goldschmidt for entrusting me with presenting his restitution case today. On this painting, you see Arthur Goldschmidt, the way he was portrayed by his Bolivian daughter-in-law. And on the photograph, we see him 60 years old, one year before he died in immigration. Arthur Goldschmidt grew up in Leipzig with his sister, Claire, Elsa, Hilda, and his brother, Fritz. He perceived his parents' home a meeting point of artists and intellectuals. It was a city mansion with a smoking room, a music room, a dining room, and a conservatory where, as his daughter Hannah Laura writes in her autobiography, there were discussion evenings, readings, and private house concerts. His father, Adolf Goldschmidt, had um, a wholesale corn merchants, active internationally, called Kleie Gold. And that was the basis for the prosperity and for the generous patronage the family showed to Leipzig University. When the father was old enough to retire from business, Arthur, as the oldest son, had to take over the business. He'd rather have gone to university and done something in the arts, his daughter remembers. And so Arthur used his resources also to build up a considerable library comprising 40,000 books, among them a collection of almanacs. In 1932, he published a Goethe bibliography in the almanac. 
After 1933, the family business went to the Nazi governing body for food production. The siblings, nephews and nieces of his wife, Hertha, did not survive the Holocaust. Arthur, together with his wife and children, managed to emigrate to Bolivia in 1939. His daughter's uh, description tells us that he died there in poverty and a broken man. He had to leave everything behind, she remembers, his books and all he wanted to do. In 1936, when the family situation in Leipzig was already life-threatening, the Goethe and Schiller archive of Weimar purchased the Almanac collection of 2,000 volumes for next to nothing. The collection in 1954 was acquired by a predecessor institution of the Duchess Anna Amalia Library. It was only 2005 so early compared to other restitution cases. The library initiated the restitution process and agreed to purchase the almanacs from the heirs. The procedure, which um, culminated temporarily in 2012, is today considered to be one of the largest restitution cases of a German library. Atonement for stolen books was the headline of Frankfurter Allgemeine Zeitung in a long article. In 2014, two years after the restitution, a controversial debate about the motivation and integrity of the acquisition policy the Goethe-Schiller archive during the NS period started. That alone was not surprising. What was surprising is that in 2014 we find similar justification strategies of this theft of a cultural heritage, same as we found in 1936. We find stereotype cliches saying we have to have a just an equitable solution for a balancing act and we want to end Nazi terror and injustice. At the heart of the controversy in 2014 was the exchange of letters between Arthur Goldschmidt and the Weimar Archive in 1935-1936. Reading that, you see step by step what the dissipation process of the collection really was. We notice how Goldschmidt was, his prices kept being beaten down. According to his own estimates, he'd spent something like 50,000 Reichsmark on the collection originally, and he offered it for 15,000 Reichsmark and ended up accepting 2,000 Reichsmark. Hans Wahl, the then director of the Goethe and Schiller archives and the director of the Goethe National Museum, was informed uh, that Goldschmidt, as he, and he quotes, has to vacate the room where the collection is housed as soon as possible. Val pointed for at a remainder of a reserve fund, which um, they said to Goethe, they would sacrifice for this purchase. Between the archive and the Goethe Society in Weimar, there was a, an administration community, and the committee of that community had to approve the funds for the purchase. The report submitted by Hans Wahl to the body and the final minutes make very clear what the internal institutional view of the case was. In this report, Hans Wahl says that Goldschmidt's attempt to sell the collection elsewhere for a higher price had failed. And Wahl had thought that, in his opinion, the necessary special funds to be provided by the Reich for funding would not to be expected here, probably because, of course, Mr. Goldschmidt is a Jew. And he continues, I again I quote, Mr. Goldschmidt is now willing to give us this important collection for 2,000 Reichmark. And he then adds that Goldschmidt himself is no longer speaking of a business transaction, but about caring for his collection. Wahl concludes, and I quote, under these circumstances, this acquisition is an extraordinarily advantageous affair and a much wished for addition to the limited almanac inventory of the archive. The finest protocol also emphasizes that the purchase price is only an acknowledgement price, so they knew jolly well what they were doing. Goldschmidt must have been 
deeply hurt by the way the archive acted, as we can see when we read the last sentence in his final letter to the archive executive board in April 1936. He writes, I hope that when you list and analyze the collection, you will experience a great deal of joy and triumph about the price of this collection. The price of the collection, it, it was originally typewritten, was then corrected by him in his own handwriting into pride and triumph about this cheaply acquired collection. Among the members of the committee deciding to approve the purchase of the almanacs was the head of the Leipzig Insel Publishing House, Anton Kippenberg, who was also a member of the board of the Goethe Society. Kippenberg knew Goldschmidt from the collecting scene in Leipzig, and he himself had ordered a book on Goethe in the almanac. Just a year before, Kippenberg had uh, talked uh, to Harry Gaunt Kessler and uh, admitted to being anti-Semitic and saying that, of course, he could only exercise this privately by not buying from Jews. Now, the way the archive um, acted is only something we can consider an expression of institutional cynicism, which means that this is an institution which profits from injustice, considers its own purchase price a sacrifice and a benefit for somebody else, and then makes itself believe that this unlawful acquisition was an act of generosity. Back in 1937, six, we see that this argument turned in its end in 2014, and the controversy about the Ars Pro Toto magazine publishing an article about this restitution case, where the archive is considered to be a, a profiteer, benefiting from the dis desperate situation of Goldschmidt, and they called what they did calculating and cynical. But the publication of the Circle of Friends of the Goethe National Museum in Weimar, they say apologetically that the archive at the time was itself in a financial difficult, financially difficult situation. Hans Wall, when this transaction was undertaken in April 96, he, and I quote, probably only expressed a quiet uh, satisfaction about saving cultural treasure for the Weimar research centers. That is what a former head of a Weimar archive supposed. And in that way, he turned on its head what Wahl had actually written about the triumph. What are the motivations which drove Hans Wahl and Anton Kippenberg in this transaction? Hans Wahl describes the acquisition as an extraordinary enrichment for the archive in the sense of providing artistic added value. Indeed, what it is, is a good deal to the detriment of the victim of NS persecution, Arthur Goldschmidt, and as such, it is one element in the economic exploitation of the Jewish population. When we're looking from the angle of 2014 and see what they did, and people still say this is uh, something which they were forced to do out of uh, financial necessity and they tried to save a cultural treasure, and that simply ignores the manifest racist ideological persecution Hans Wahl mentions, which the Goldschmidts uh, suffered and which pushed the market value down, which is why the investment was so much worth it for the archive. After a meeting of the uh, Weimar Classics Foundation published results of its meeting where they looked at uh, Weimar cultural elites and national socialism, the city of Weimar did not wish to keep the street named after Hans Wahl and actually renamed it. Since uh, 1949, it was the address of the Goethe Schiller archive, and they actually removed the Hans Wahl name then in 2016. When the Duchess Anna Amalia Library, as part of its own systematic research, hit on the Goldschmidt case in 2005, one year later, they commissioned the London Commission for Looted Art in Europe to find heirs. Members of the family then visited the foundation in the years following. And in 2009, it was agreed that the collection was to remain in Weimar. Two valley appraisals were commissioned in uh, agreement of both parties, and they also agreed on 
the purchase price. Since the claims conference was the uh, successor in title according to the Property Act, a three-part contract had to be drawn up. In early 2013, the public was informed about this restitution in a joint press briefing. And in this amicable settlement, they also made clear once again that the Goldschmidt heirs now had the right to dispose of the collection. The purchase of the Weimar Library is thanks to support given by the uh, Cultural Foundation of the German States. The case could only finally be concluded in 2018 because there, the amicable settlement did have uh, a reservation which concerned 49 of the almanacs. Otto Goldschmidt's collection comprises 2,000 almanacs dating from the 17th to the 19th centuries. The range, thematic range is from the famous um, um, almanacs of the muses down to ballet dancing to specialist calendars on drama, military, forestry and hunting. There is very attractive source material for cultural scientific research in it. The online catalog of the library and a blog document the collection and the history of this case extremely well. A mobile showcase, Nazi looted art in the foyers of the individual buildings of the uh, Weimar Classics Foundation also confronts the audience with more case studies and with information about provenance research, which, uh, are, which all take as a starting point Hans Wahl's uh, key quote of the extraordinarily affordable purchase. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Thomas Lessmann. So one more case for you then. Before we meet up for a panel discussion, I'd like to ask Nina and Rex McGee to come. Siegfried Lemler's Legacy, a story of restitution and reconnection is the name of their talk. So a very warm welcome also into our audience the heirs of Arthur Goldschmidt. A very warm welcome to you. Well, good afternoon. Uh, uh, thank you for your fortitude uh, to uh, still be listening at this point in the day. I hope you all had coffee uh, at the break and uh, still have a little left in you. Um, my name is um, Rex McGeehy. Uh, this is my wife, Nina McGeehy. Uh, um, our presentation is entitled The Legacy of Siegfried Limley, Restitution and Reconnection. Uh, Nina, who is Siegfried Limley's great-granddaughter, uh, wrote this talk. Uh, she is Moses in this occasion, and I am but Aaron, uh, just the mouthpiece, uh, as she doesn't particularly uh, enjoy large crowds, and um, I, I don't like to touch anything with a button because it breaks immediately. So. Um, <laughs> We are, we are happy uh, to be here. Uh, we wanted to thank Dr. Gilbert Lupfer and the German Lost Art Foundation for the invitation to present Siegfried Limley's story and the meaning and value of restitution to our family. We are really honored to be here. Thank you. Um, our story begins in the late 1930s. And by the way, we promised to do this in 15 minutes, and I'm going to do my very best. Uh, so, okay, it begins in the late 1930s with Nina's parents, Hilde and Stephen who were both German-speaking children of successful Jewish families. It's okay? Okay. Uh, Nina's mother, Hilde, was Siegfried Limley's oldest and favorite grandchild. She lived with him for several periods from the age of seven until she married. Siegfried was an esteemed Jewish, German, art, and antique dealer whose Munich business flourished between 1895 and 1938. When the Nazi Reich, it's okay? Okay. When the Nazi Reich forced the closure of Jewish businesses in 1938, the family fled to the United States, sponsored by Carl Lemley, Siegfried's younger brother and the founder of Universal Studios. When Germany invaded Poland in 1939, Nina's father, Stephen, was 11 years old. He and his family fled from Danzig to India, where they spent the war years before coming to the United States in 1946.
Hildy and Stephen had met when they were at the University of California. They married and raised their three daughters with an eclectic fusion of atheism, Christmas trees, Easter eggs, and Jewish intellectual and cultural identifications. This mix reflected their own assimilated Jewish backgrounds. In fact, their children didn't even learn that they were Jewish until they were in elementary school. Psychological research shows us that children develop solid identities when their parents can tell coherent stories about their lives. Stephen loved to tell stories about his escape from Poland. It really was an adventure. Uh, he enjoyed talking about his family and early adulthood. Hildy, however, Nina's mother, never talked about her childhood or the important figures in her life. She recalls now that when she started school in the United States, she buried her German Jewish identity and dropped her German accent so as to be accepted. She did such a good job that her connection to her childhood story and her terror heritage were buried as well. In 2004, Hildy and her cousins were contacted by the IKG, Jewish Community of Vienna, about an Austrian restitution. While they expressed pleasure in receiving some money, they were not particularly curious about it. When Stephen died in 2016, Nina began searching for answers and found emails with Sabina Leutfellner of the IKG about negotiations with German museums as well. There was also a request by Thomas Stahler, a German filmmaker, to interview Hildy about her grandfather for a 2014 documentary under the hammer of the Nazis. In 2016, we received a copy of this film. We were stunned by the discoveries in the Weinmuller catalogs and Siegfried Lindley's story in the context of Nazi art looting. For the first time, Nina and her sisters understood a piece of their mother's story the person most important to her, her grandfather, Siegfried, and the family's losses. We'll show you now a brief clip from this film. The Lemle Art and Antiques dealership is a Munich business with a long-standing tradition. Lemle is specialized in medieval sculptures of the highest quality. Siegfried Lemle, the company founder, is held in high esteem in professional circles. One of his customers is the Paris Louvre, to the Nazis, none of that counts. Family Lemley has a decision to make. My mother wanted to leave right away. My father always said, I've never done anything wrong, why should I leave? He could not understand sure. what really happened. The Lemleys also have to close their business. What is to happen with their private collection and their extensive inventory? In essence, regarding emigration, for example, a Jewish dealer XY was forced to sell his collection at auction in the appropriate auction house XY. The proceeds were immediately confiscated as part of the Jewish capital levy or Reich flight tax. Or rather, some Jewish collectors emigrated, and a so-called protection order was imposed on their entire inland assets. Then all their possessions went straight to the Reich's finance ministry. The Lemley family escapes to the U.S. in 1938. Today, Siegfried Lemley's granddaughter lives in Minneapolis. Only seven years old, she had to leave her native Germany. Back then, her grandfather never wanted to leave. She remembers. It took a lot of persuading. I mean, he had this business, and even though he lost a lot of it, uh, he kept saying, well, what do they want with an old guy like me? And my parents, I think, rightfully felt if they left them behind, they would perish. They left late. We all left late. Her childhood photos have remained. and her memories. You come. I loved going to Munich. And my grandfather, he would try to teach me things like einen Platz für jedes Ding, jedes Ding auf seinen Platz. I loved him. She has long shut off the subject of Germany and the things she was forced to leave behind. 
you know, I think, I think all of us were just glad to be alive, you know, and to have enough money to live. Only now, Siegfried Lemley's descendants in the USA grasp the full dimension of the theft to their family. It is the first step in her quest for the objects from her grandfather's collection. It's still a little unreal for me. I mean, it fills out so much that we didn't know. And maybe we'll see some of it. I mean, it would be a miracle. The uh, discovery of the Weinmuller catalogs by Katrin Stahl of the Neumeister Auction House and Micah Hopp truly was remarkable and demonstrated amazing courage on the part of Katrin Stahl. Siegfried Limley was born in Laupheim in 1863 to a successful Jewish merchant. He was the seventh of 13 children. Really can't compare to 17, I don't suppose, but uh, only five of these survived into adulthood. Although Siegfried's first career was peddling wine, liquor, and cigars, his passions were medieval and early Renaissance art and antiques. In 1895, he took out a loan with the help of his family and bought a superb art library and leased his first Munich shop. During his 40-year career, his business ranked among Munich's most prominent dealerships, including those of Julius Bowler, Henry Heilbronner, Otto Bernheimer, and Hugo Helbing. King Ludwig of Bavaria, Prince Ruprecht, and museums in Berlin, Munich, Cologne, Frankfurt, and the Louvre were among his clients. In 1899, Siegfried married Betty Frankel. We have a clip of Carl Limley's film, Laupheim 1925, um, featured in ca the Carl Limley exhibit at the Laupheim Christian and Jewish Museum. It gives a sense of what Siegfried must have been like as a man with character, energy, and relatedness. things you can do when your brother founds a film studio. identical twins, they were not. Siegfried and Betty. We also want to thank uh, Michael Nimitz, the director of the museum there, for helping us uh, get this clip of the film. <coughs> Okay, Siegfried and Betty had three children between 1900 and 1904. Ernst, who has two surviving sons, Christopher and Michael. Walter, married later in life and went into business with his father, and Trudy, who was Hildy's mother. In the mid to late 1930s, as the Nazis became more powerful, anti-Semitism became acceptable. Jewish art dealers received letters from the Berlin Reichkulturkammer in August of 1935 that the art trade was being reorganized. As Jews could not reliably represent Aryan values, they were ordered to close their shops. Siegfried and his peers objected. They were Germans first, and besides, flooding the art market would hurt the art trade. The second argument bought them some time. Adolf Weinmuller, a Nazi and Munich auctioneer, used the new decree to his advantage to force Jewish dealers to bring their art and antiques to his auction house. By maintaining an outward appearance of neutrality, he gained the business of Jewish dealers and business soared. In the spring of 1938, Siegfried sold the last of his stocks, closed his business, and applied to immigrate to the United States and prepared his 130-piece private collection for shipment. Aware that the Limleys were about to sail, Weinmuller sent a representative from the North Tax Office to make a list of the items. Once they departed, Weinmuller seized the shipment sold some of the collection and kept the remainder. Although Siegfried and his son Walter opened an art and antique shop in Los Angeles in 1940, 
it never achieved its stature of the Munich business. In 1948, they applied for compensation from the German government, but most of the objects had ended up in private hands or museums, so compensation was meager. Siegfried died at the age of 90 in 1953. Fifty years passed, and in 1998, the 44 countries convened to approve the Washington Principles. These non-binding principles were to guide countries in their treatment of Nazi confiscated art. Provenance researchers and other experts were engaged to identify such art, publish provenances, contact heirs, and make restitution. Austria has a developed formula for dealing with Nazi confiscated art. So when Sabina Leutfellner of the Vienna IKG contacted Siegfried's heirs in 2004 to restitute works from the Albertina Museum, the process seemed fairly straightforward. Since then, as a representative of the IKG, she has worked with us to resolve restitutions with German museums. Germany has no clear formula for restitution, so each one has had its unique challenges. We are grateful to Sabina for her perseverance. She has done all the hard work. She has settled restitutions with the Frankfurt Stadel Museum, Munich Stadt Museum, Lindbach House, Bavarian National Museum, Stuttgart Landis Museum, and the Munich Theater Museum. The art and antiques restituted have included medieval and early Renaissance objects, drawings, watercolors, and oil painting, and a small sculpture. Though it also should be noted that this amounts to several dozen pieces, whereas there is an estimated more than 1,000 which were lost due to forced sale or by theft from Siegfried Limley's collection. In June of 2017, a year after Stephen died, Nino organized a Munich visit with the intent to learn more about restitution and to reconnect Hildy with memories of her early childhood and her grandfather. At age 85, Hildy, her three daughters, and a granddaughter visited the Munich Stadt Museum, Limbach House, Bavarian National Museum, and Munich Central Institute of Art History. Hildy did recall early memories of walks in the English garden with her grandfather and the lemon drops he kept in his pocket for her. The journey ended in the beer garden with filmmaker Thomas Staler, art historian Dr. Micah Hopp, and the Neumeister auction house owner Katrin Stahl, each of whom has helped us fill out Siegfried's story. Last April, Nina and I returned to Germany to attend an exhibition opening, participate in a colloquium, reconnect with people Nina had met, and learn more about her family's history. Our first stop was in Laupheim, where we visited the Christian and Jewish Museum and met members of Geschichte und Gedenken, a volunteer organization that studies, publishes, and gives tours about Laupheim's history. Elizabeth and Christoph showed us Siegfried's birth home and school, the old Jewish neighborhood, the Jewish cemetery, Limley family gravestones, and the Carl Limley High School. We were very touched by their openness and generosity, and I might add the work that they had done on the cemetery was really uh, beautiful. Our next stop was the Stuttgart Landis Museum, where seven of Siegfried's objects were restituted to us. The care the staff took to prepare the items for their journey back to the United States was remarkable, and we both found ourselves close to tears as we drove away. These were truly exceptional people, and I'm telling you, it was exceptional packaging as well. Um, in Munich, we attended the Central Institute's Provenance Research Colloquium and presented Siegfried's family history and our restitution experiences. It was such an honor to be asked to speak to a group of such dedicated academics, provenance researchers, and sponsors, <coughs> and we enjoyed the connection so very much. We want to specifically thank Dr. Christian Furmeister and Dr. Micah Hopp for that opportunity. The next day, we participated in the Bavarian National Museum's restitution of a sculpture, which happens to appear in a photo of Siegfried in his shop, and whose sister sculpture, coincidentally, is in the Minneapolis Art Institute, not far from where Hildy currently lives. That evening, we attended the opening of the Munich Stadt Museum's exhibition, Former Jewish-Owned Property. It was a wonderful event and a powerful, beautifully displayed exhibit. We just learned that it has been extended through January 6th due to its success, so you still have time if you haven't seen it. On our last day, we visited the Munich Theater Museum, learned about the medieval watercolors that had belonged to Siegfried, and resolved amongst family members that they continue to stay in the care of that museum. 
um, this, we had such a, such a fun conversation that we just did this last week. And um, it was really a thoughtful uh, meeting with a really fascinating group of people there at the museum. It has been quite a journey. <clears throat> the term restitution has acquired many meanings for our family. For Hildy, there are feelings of anger and sadness associated with loss and dislocation. But restitution has been reparative. It has allowed her to reconnect with positive childhood memories, her country of origin, and her grandfather, whom she loved so dearly. In just another recent meaningful turn, Hildy, who is now 87, who twice lived in Germany after the war, just this month regained her German citizenship. For Nina and her sisters, restitution has paved the way for meaningful relationships with those of you who have been part of our journey. By understanding Hildy's losses and need to fit in, we have found a new empathy for her. And last but not least, Nina and her sisters have also reconnected with their family history and German heritage. In our encounters with all of you involved in restitution, we have been moved by your kindness and generosity. While of course we cannot change the horrors of the past, but what we do now can change our relationships to one another and how we affect the future together. We thank you for your dedication and heart. Thank you so much, Nina and Rex, Mike Gehe. Have a good stay in Berlin. So, liebe so, participants, I know it's getting late. We've heard a great deal, but now we want to meet for one last round. We've heard some restitution stories with reasonably happy ends where both sides were happy that have led to a number of amazing examples. But what happens if things don't work out this way? We want to look at the whole range of just and fair solutions in a more problematic way in our last panel. And I would suggest, because we haven't done this at all, I think that we We'll have a very quick question and answer session now. Maybe you have a little bit you want to say. But first, let me introduce Colette Avital. She's a diplomat, a politician. Here she is the chair of the Center Organization of Holocaust Survivors in Israel. This is an umbrella organization that has many different associations that belong to it that deal with the needs of uh, Holocaust survivors in Israel, as well as the Jewish Claims Conference representative in Israel. Welcome to you. I'd also like to ask you to welcome Wesley Fischer, who is the head of the Jewish Claims Conference in Germany, the World Jewish Restitution Organization, and in both institutions he is responsible for the question of confiscated art by the Nazis. He was one of the people who worked on the Washington Principles 20 years ago. Welcome to you, Wesley. I'm very pleased that we also have Hermann Siemann here, who for a long time was the director of the foundation of the new synagogue Berlin, the Centrum Judaicum. He has been critically committed I think you'll be critically committed to this round as well. And as the head of the Funding Advisory Council, he has an important role when it comes to funding many projects to do with provenance research for solving crimes committed by the Nazis around artwork. And now I also want to welcome Lucien Simmons, who is the deputy head of Sotheby's where he heads the restitution department based in New York, and he specializes in Impressionism and classic modernity. And since 97, he's been active in provenance research, working closely together with art collectors and their advisors in the US, in Europe, and has also been involved in many restitution processes. So this is our round for you here. Now, as I said already, we want to look at some of the difficult cases, the difficulties that we have. The Washington principles want just and fair solutions. 
both when an owner or their heirs can be found and when this is not the case as well. So my question to all of you here is how can you achieve a just and fair solution in a case like this when you can find the heirs? What aspects are important there? Colette Abital is already nodding at me, so let me put this question to you, if you would take the floor, Colette. Thank you very much. Actually, I've been up on my feet since 3 o'clock this morning, so I hope Ooh. that I will sound coherent. And uh, I realize that we're the only thing left between you and dinner, so we will try to be brief. Um, I would like to say that uh, I didn't think of this subject before you asked this question, but I was involved in cases of restitution. In the year 2000, uh, I read an article in a paper in Israel saying that there were many people who had lost their lives in the Holocaust. There were bank accounts and properties in Israel which had not been returned. I was in the parliament. We created an investigation committee. It was very difficult first to find the assets because the banks and others did not want to show them. It took us five years. And then, as a result, we actually passed the law and we started looking for the hairs. In many cases, we found them. It was really like you here do provenance research for the arts. It was doing the same about people who sometimes had similar names, lived on the same street in the same town. So it was very complicated to find out who the real owner was. But at the end of the day, if we had not passed that law, there would not have been a restitution. So because there are cases that are so complicated, and we've been listening the whole day here about what provenance research demands and how much more has to be done, I think that there has to be legislation because without legislation in the various countries, we will continue to stay on the same spot. At the same time, I think we have to think also not only of opening the gate, showing people um, artworks which may be exhibited in order listed and then exhibited in order to have possible hairs come forward. I think somebody once said that every object begins with an owner who can either be his creator or his collector. And we have 100,000 such articles dormant in vaults in many museums. Yes, provenance research has to do be done, but there has to be some kind of a timetable. And those works of art have to be listed and shown to the public. And if, at the end of this process, there are no hairs, then the question is, what should be done with hairless property? And here I come as a Holocaust survivor. I represent Holocaust survivors in Israel. I am, you know, I listen to all these wonderful stories of restitution. And I must say, I grew up also on my grandfather's knees. And I was educated by him when looking at the paintings on his walls, who were then taken away confiscated or looted. And I would love for the life of me to hold such an object in my hand in order to connect to my grandfather. But this will not happen because not only did the Nazis loot, what they did not finish, the communists finished. So what I su suppose we should actually do is see to it number one, that there is legislation in the countries which compels people to take more of a, an active role. And second, when it comes to the hairless, what we call the hairless, if we did not find the hairs, then I would turn back to a decision that was taken or to the resolution that was taken in Vilnius at the, in the year of 2000, in the year of 2000, it was said, it was recognized 
that these were the properties of the Jewish people. And I hope I'm not shocking anyone by saying here tonight what belonged to the Jewish people should go back to the Jewish people. In other words, yes, there are possible museums, there are ways of showing this art, but I think at the end of the day, instead of sitting in museums, these works of art that are hairless should go back to the Jewish people. And as Jewish folk was back to the Jewish people. What does that mean, Wesley Fisher? I'm going to repeat again. So what does that mean if there are objects that have no heirs and they go back to the Jewish people, to Jewish claims? Or what are just and fair solutions from where you're standing? The discussion is occurring after the discussions by the various descendants because it shows something about this question of what are just and fair solutions for? For whom are they? To whom is this supposed to happen? There is a problem that because of the policies of the American military, and indeed of the Western allies generally, that the various items were sent to the capitals of the various countries and then stayed with the government. So now we are dealing with this question of governments, and some of this discussion today has been about fairness, essentially, to the governments, to the museums, and so on. That's not what was originally intended. Uh, indeed, the Jews just after World War II could not stand that policy, and they fought against it so that in 1947, the American military recognized the Jewish Restitution Successor Organization and its affiliate, Jewish Cultural Reconstruction, which was essentially dealing with the, the, those unclaimed properties. Uh, I think that some of this is coming about because the Holocaust was so incredibly more than anything, any pogroms or anything of this sort that the Jewish uh, world had experienced, and this time, there would have to be a different uh, reaction. Uh, may I say that here in Germany, the Jewish Restitution Successor Organization has been followed subsequently with the reunification of Germany with the successor organization of the Jewish Claims Conference. And this has been a reasonable way of going about the question of what should happen to items that are either not claimed or are only partially claimed uh, and the like. Uh, I, I have to say that the question as to what is airless is really a definitional matter. It's a political matter. At what point do you say that unclaimed property is going to really just simply be labeled as airless and dealt with in uh, some other way? But let me say that the modes of representing the interests of the Jewish people in this regard vary according to different countries. So, for example, in Austria, there is a governmental organization which works very closely with Jewish organizations that proceeds to deal with this question of unclaimed property. In Poland, there is the Jewish Historical Institute, which is a government institution, but it works closely with Jewish, uh, the Jewish community, and it essentially gathers together in one place the most of, or much of, the unclaimed uh, cultural property. Uh, in some other countries, or some other possibilities, you have the possibility of the government of the State of Israel taking on this role. You have, in some countries such as Russia, Jewish religious sects that are favored by the government, and they have the ability to deal with this at least to some extent. You also have the World Jewish Restitution Organization's foundations, which consist of representatives of the local Jewish community, international Jewish community, and then also the government of the country, which could conceivably take this on as well. In many countries, Jewish interests are simply ignored, which is a different uh, problem. Well, it's not a different problem, but it's a, it's a difficulty. Let me say that there is an aspect of this that needs to be addressed, which is that there is a problem when there are no claimants, and
And the question is, should the property be repatriated to a country from which it came? An example of this, the University of Leipzig, along with a good many other libraries in the Reich, from Hamburg in the northwest to uh, Vienna in the southeast, received books from the Getze Khan Publishing House, which was the main publishing house of the former Yugoslavia and a, a well-known matter. You can still see the Getze Khan uh, shop, if you will, on the main uh, street in Belgrade. The, for various reasons, having to do with the German courts, it was determined that items that were in the former East Germany that could be claimed otherwise by the claims conference could not be, be uh, that would not apply if the items had been taken in another country. So what happened? The University of Leipzig gave as a gift the Getze Khan books that it had to the National Library of Serbia. Now there's maybe nothing wrong with that. It may well be that the National Library of Serbia is where these books belong. But no Jewish organizations were consulted, neither the Jewish community of Serbia, nor the claims conference, and most importantly, no one used the opportunity to say to the National Library of Serbia, please, you also need to do provenance research on your collection. So this is an issue, and it's a more general issue, I think, than people may often realize. Let me say that what we're talking about is not that these items should move physically, necessarily. It's not a question of that. It's rather, as in the Austrian case, there is a listing on a website, and basically you know which are the items that so far are unclaimed, and eventually there may be some use of them or disposition of them, but that's a much longer matter. The reason that should happen that way is partly because the costs and physical care of such unclaimed cultural property as well as the continuing attempt to identify owners and heirs, will probably need to continue for the next 10 to 20 years, at least, uh, depending on, on the, uh, the country. Um, and if you were to transfer these items to, I don't know, to a successor organization, to, a, you know, to other institutions and so forth, if you actually transferred the ownership now, that's what I'm talking about, uh, if you were actually to transfer them physically, this would mean a large financial and technical burden put, again, on the victims and their heirs. But a distinction needs to be made between responsibility for the costs and physical care of such cultural property and the right to have a say in how that cultural property is utilized. Decision-making, by with the involvement of Jewish representation, should include the right to exhibit the object on loan both within the country and outside it in Israel or elsewhere. Leslie, ich muss ein bisschen unterbrechen, sonst kommen wir zum Ende. I'm going to have to stop you. To stop in any event. So unclaimed looted objects may not make the only or the best uh, exhibitions of art as such or of the history of Jewish artists and art collectors, but they may help in Holocaust education. And it may well be that this will help in terms of a just and fair community. Thank you. And the moral sort of benefit from all these things which haven't yet been settled is, I think, something which we all know. Uh, we, we all recognize the potential that comes out of that. A much debated question in this context is also the question of the gap. What happens when, Mr. Seaman, the last steps simply cannot be undertaken because there is no documentation? How can we deal with this gap in provenance and have a fair and just solution? Well, before I try and answer your question, I would like to um, pick up on what the previous speaker said, at least two points I'd, I'd really love to address. First of all, I've been up since six. It's not that much better than you. Um, no, um, seriously, as far as unclaimed unclaimed um, stolen art is concerned, 
I believe and agree with you that uh, solutions without uh, the JCC seems impossible. We have to involve the claims conference. But we mustn't forget, which I think sometimes people do, that the situation of Jews in Germany, for example, today is totally different from what happened immediately after liberation. I mean, today, not that long ago in Berlin, we had a Jewish future conference. We are thinking, we're we actually convinced that we're going to be here to stay. At least that is my impression. Um, without a local Jewish community, solutions cannot be found either. So to uh, involve the Jewish voices. So my second question, this uh, uh, gap in, in provenance research, which for reasons of history and, and, and law uh, is something which is always the subject of research. But how do we deal with what cannot be documented anymore? Well, I think, first of all, it's a momentary gap. I think we, we simply mustn't say, well, that's it, over um, research, over and done with. I think research on the objects has to continue, as simple as that. And some things which five, ten years ago we all considered impossible can well be found out now. Things have become much more possible today. So on the one hand, I'm very much in favor of uh, accelerating uh, things a bit. But also, um, I mean, I, I come from um, coin collection and, and knowledge of medals. We all know that a medal always has two. Uh, sides. So I'm also in favor of not giving up on thoroughness in favor of a quick solution. I think that also has to do with the funding of provenance research. Yeah, it's, it's a very long drawn out process, provenance research. I'd like to know, Ms. Simmons, since uh, we've heard that, um, you know, we're doing provenance research for us, that's normal, we have to do that. What do you think is the change of, of attitude which has uh, happened in the free art trade by things like provenance research? What has changed in the past 20 years? Because the whole art dealing world is always a bit of the, the bad guy in the provenance research debate. Um, well, I shall start, I guess, by saying that Sotheby's has had a provenance research department for 21 years. Uh, we started off with principles for research on paintings and artworks we have for sale back in 1997, so the year before the Washington Conference. And the thing to remember is we're starting from the opposite end to everybody else on this panel. Uh, as Ambassador Eisenstadt said this morning, we have tens of thousands of artworks offered to us to sell every year at Sotheby's. Um, and our aim, uh, our desperation, is not to sell looted works of art. So what we're trying to do is to sift the works of art which come in for sale and which we're asked to appraise and reduce the risk as far as we can to zero that we might accidentally sell a work of art which is stolen but never given back. So what we're doing is sifting and sifting and sifting, doing thorough research like the museums to try and minimize that risk. Occasionally, um, I would guess 20, 30 times a year, we will find artworks where we believe there's a chance they might have been looted never given back and that's where we go into a triage mode and we try and work with our consigners our clients uh, to work out the best way to reach a just-in-fair solution taking the words from the Washington principle so what we will typically try to do is to work with uh, our clients with their lawyers their advisors and advise them on the best way to reach a compromise if indeed we believe that an artwork has been stolen, never given back. So to give you an example, in the last two weeks, Sotheby's in New York sold a Schiele oil painting, which was stolen in Vienna in 1941 um, and was never recovered by the family that lost it. Um, like some of the people we heard this morning speaking, Sotheby's reached out with the permission of the current owner to the heirs of the family who lost it in Vienna and over a period of four years, helped the current owners and the heirs of Elsie Kodacek, for that was her name, to reach what they and we regarded as being a just and fair solution, which involved the sale of the work and the division of the proceeds. But the important thing, and really this is where we come back to what's been said by the other members of this panel, the important thing was that as part of that process, 
we were able to serve the, the soft interests, if you like, of all the parties. So as well as achieving a financial price for the owners, we were also able to celebrate the memory of Oxycodacek. We were able to talk about remembrance, talk about how culture in Vienna had been the subject of direct attack and how the original owner had been attacked. So we were able to actually put back the history behind the work. And as well as reaching a financial solution, also we reached a solution where all the parties felt that they had actually regained part of their history. And I should say that the, the most remarkable thing for me of that whole process was that on the day of the auction sale two weeks ago, uh, we had a lunch for the family who had owned the painting up until a few weeks ago, um, where they could meet the Kodacek family. And they all stood around and they realized, again, this picks up on what Ambassador Eisenstadt this morning said, they all realized that the victim had died in the 1950s. They were both the victims of the same crisis in the 20th century, and they weren't, neither side was a monster. We weren't trying to apportion blame, and so the people there actually realized they were humans and they were coming to a solution, which is a very human solution. Hmm. Thank you for this example. I would like to widen the debate so in the audience you can start thinking about the question of comments you would like to make. But first of all, let me ask, uh, if you were to take a wide angle lens view of the art scene, um, the art dealing scene, is there a change of mentality, a change of attitude which has happened over the past 20 years regarding provenance? Or is it Sotheby's and Christie's doing one thing and everybody else not really? Um, there has been a, a wider change of, change of opinion as well. Uh, when I started in this field 20 years ago, my colleagues in Sotheby's, when I said, we need to have a full provenance for the war years in our catalogs, they said, don't mention the war. It'll put, it'll put people off. So if you have to mention Hermann Goering, say, a senior Nazi officer, because it might, might stop people buying artworks. The, the real change for us, and I think it's throughout the art world, is the story is integral to the artwork. So now people are used to saying, where was this work from 1933 to 1945? And if it was in a bad place and was later given back, then that's actually a point of pride that this is actually a part of the history of the work and a painting to be a document. It can actually be an, a piece of evidence showing 20th century history and the history of those who were persecuted, as well as being an artwork in its own right. Colette Avital. I think that we're on to something which we were also thinking of. Looted art for us is an emotional question, a moral question, a question of justice, but it is also a question of education. And I think that what has to come out, maybe, of this conference also is the issue of education. In other words, we held a conference in Israel about a month ago preparing for this conference and we adopted certain resolutions which I would be glad to share with whoever wants. It's called the Jerusalem Declaration. One of the things that we would like to do in Israel is to have those works of art, maybe not the best works of art, which are so difficult to transport, and, but to have exhibitions, certainly in Israel, which, have, which are telling the Israeli public and others the history of the looting, the history of those families. It is 1,000 years of Jewish culture that have been destroyed. It is not only the fact that they wanted to wipe out the Jews, it is our identity. It is what we loved, what we strove for. So we think that we have to be able to use those works of art also as tools of education and have maybe on loan from this museum some of these works of art come to Israel, for instance, have exhibitions, and then send them on to other countries so that people could learn from it. I believe that this is a dimension which was not really discussed, and I think we have to put it on the table. Hmm. 
Well, certainly tomorrow and the next day, that matter will be an issue. I can promise you that. Now, floor is yours. We have about 10 minutes left, and I'd love to use them. I know it's not a lot of time for you, but please use the opportunity. We have a roving mic, so just indicate you wish to take the floor. And uh, please be so kind as to introduce yourself uh, by name and or institution. Christian Formeister, uh, Central um, Institute for Art History. Better late than never. And the speaker continues in English. Day long, and um, we didn't um, talk about the title of the conference, which is the future. We talked about the past, the tr past 20 years. Regarding the future, I would like to quote Stuart Eisenstadt. He said, provenance research is the foundation stone of restitution. So my question to you, the panel, but also the audience is, how is Germany doing with regard to provenance research? How can we possibly think that it is possible, and Annette Gerlach also pointed this out, that we have three months projects given the size of the task, looking at the challenge we are facing, this is incredible. It is a continued scandal that Germany thinks that provenance research can be done in 12-month projects or 24-month projects. And this is an outcry and it is a continued scandal because we have to establish structures, infrastructures, and we are not doing as good as we can possibly do. And if Magnus Brechtgen says only free research, independent, open-ended research, that is the way to do restitution and to solve this part of history. But if we don't invest into research, this is no use. I would like to thank you very much for this um, interjection. I would like to give the floor to the person who said there are no such things as gaps, only open questions. That's hard to close uh, as a gap. What do you think about that? Well, on principle, I agree with you. A lot more does need to be done. The word scandal might be not quite so forward, because I think you know that word should be used for what is a genuine scandal. But all the same, I'm very grateful to Mrs. Gerlach for pointing this out today. I've been asked by young people, too, who are walking around with this button here. I mean, and that's, they do that so that we see it. I was a bit irritated by it, and I think, yes, we need to do something. We've heard so many different things today that I find it difficult to sort of choose any one point. But uh, at the end of her contribution, um, uh, Ms. Verisix um, showed a wonderful picture um, showing that there is a change in generation, and that's a hope. Um, Ms. Savoy told that too. We have a lot of young people who have a lot of commitment and, and a great deal of empathy, let me mention that word here. These young people doing provenance research without being employed somewhere on a permanent basis, they do a lot. We need to do more, of course, but in recent years, much has already been done. Let's not forget what's been achieved uh, at the DZK in Magdeburg ever since it was founded. And from my angle and my small vantage point, I can only do things on a volunteer basis. And I'm in charge of an advisory council to the uh, DZK. And I can tell you, they're doing a lot of work. I don't think anybody would love to go through these masses of applications. And nobody finds it easy to reject claims, which does happen. So yes, a lot has been done on the one hand, but on the other hand, we need to work more quickly and also more intensively, no question about it. Are there any other questions? Uh, Wesley Fisher, would you like to comment immediately? Just two things. First of all, of course, it's very good, the additional funding that has been provided in Germany. That's, that's of course, an excellent matter. This is, of course, much larger than even Germany could manage on its own. It involves a great many countries as well. 
it's very good that the European Union, at least the Committee on Legal Affairs, is actually beginning to discuss this in the European Parliament. And it would be wonderful if the European Commission then proceeds to start funding this as a major matter. It is possible. So, eine weitere right, one more call for the floor. Es läuft, wir hören Sie. Danke sehr. Um, Können Sie sich kurz vorstellen, netterweise? Sorry. Could you briefly introduce yourself? Adam Petzold. I am trying to restitute the um, art objects of my great-grandfather, Adolf Schwarzenberg, in the Czech Republic. And as such, I have a comment to what was said before about the the benefits of the Washington principles being something which is not enforceable. And as a restituent, to me, it seems that the fact that these are not actually enforceable rules, to a certain extent, weakens the position of the restituent. Because people expect that there is a remedy out there. People expect that we can actually obtain our rights. The Czech Republic, for example, which is one of the co-initiators of the Terezin Declaration, um, completely refuses to do anything in a case where it is absolutely clear and documented what has happened to us. It was taken by personal orders of Adolf Hitler. But there is no attempt to restitute. But the public believes that because these things are out there, like the Washington Declaration, the Terezin Declaration, that restituents have, if you have a fair case, then surely you would have gotten everything back. So I'm not entirely sure that I agree that it is a good idea to have only voluntary commitments because it can potentially actually weaken the case of the restituent. I would like to hear what the panel thinks about this. Is it uh, not enough? I think that this is precisely where legislation can come in and help. And I think that the case of Austria is a case in point. There was a law which was enacted there, and this triggered and helped the whole process of restitution. So I think, unfortunately, and I hope I'm not um, offending anyone by saying that there are many cases I have encountered, not in Germany, in countries in Eastern Europe, where simply there's no will to restitute, and it's a big problem. So I think that, therefore, legislation may help. I, I would note that there is also a question of having the right legislation. The Czech Republic is known for not permitting uh, the heirs who are not direct heirs to uh, inherit, and that is indeed a problem. When you have a genocide, it's a problem. I, I just have one general comment on, on this area, and that is that for Sotheby's and I think for Christie's as well, this isn't so much a legal issue as an ethical and a market issue. Um, if we, if Sotheby's, try to put up for sale a painting which was looted in World War II and never given back, then it will damage our vendor's reputation. Nobody will buy it. It will damage our reputation. It will be a bad story in the New York Times. But all of those are soft. They're none of them legal issues. So for us, and for me, and I know for, for Monica Christie's, when we speak to one of our clients, we say it's a question of doing the right thing. The right thing actually also happens to be the commercially right thing. So often there's a, there's a confluence of commercial interests for us with doing the right thing ethically and legally. Thank you very much indeed for making clear which uh, aspects are so problematical, and I will leave you uh, to that now. Um, we can discuss it tomorrow. Now I would like to ask you over dinner to pick up on some of the issues and talk to each other about this. Let me also point out there is a problem with the cloakrooms because at 2100, when the building closes, they will also close the cloakroom. So please make sure you retrieve your coats and scarves and what have you. Thank you so much. Ihnen allen schönen Abend und danke für Ihre Aufmerksamkeit. Everyone have a lovely evening and thank you for your attention. Thank you so much.